Alright guys, so I watched the first two episodes of Star Wars The Acolyte so that you don't have to. Let's talk about it. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better. Guys, before we get into today's video, please like and subscribe. I am constantly subjecting myself to these bad shows and movies that you guys suggest so that I can get a handle on the plot, let you know what's going on there, and identify any wokeness that might have injected itself into the storyline. And Star Wars The Acolyte is no exception to that, and Star Wars fans are going to hate what I'm about to say. This was my introduction to Star Wars. I have not seen a Star Wars film, TV show show, spin-off, whatever you want to call them, this is the first introduction that I've had to this franchise, so deal with that how you will. That being said, I feel like I get an interesting opportunity to be a sort of outsider to the Star Wars universe and have this be my first exposure to the series, and what a first it was. So the series starts off and we're on the planet Ueda, and on this planet is a Jedi Master by the name of Indara. Now Indara's about to have the time of her life. That being said, more the end of her life as she's about to be faced with an assassin. Now this assassin is played by none other than Amanda Lestenberg. I'm not going to give the name of this assassin yet because we find that out throughout episode one and two. Anyways, Amanda Lestenberg walks up to Andara while she's just chilling and having a drink with some buds or whatever she's doing at the time and says, you know what? I want you to attack me and attack me with all your force, all your power. And Andara's like... Who is this girl? I'm not trying to get into it right now with you. And she says, no, I want you to attack me. Let's go, let's fight, let's brawl right now. So a fight ensues between Jedi Master Indara and this unknown assassin. And Indara finds out that this assassin can utilize the force, which is something that is not typical. She pulls out a little radio and says, we have an unauthorized use of the force. Now, nobody responds to this radio call, and I think it would be pretty interesting if they had. Here is how that would play out in my imagination, given that we know that this is a woke show. We have an unauthorized use of the Force. Copy that. We'll be right there. Can you give us a description of the assailant? Um, short, maybe 5'4", a female wearing a cloak of some sort. Can you give us any other descriptors of this unauthorized user? Maybe skin color? Uh... I'm not sure why that matters. Why does that matter? So the battle continues. Amanda Lestenberg is fighting with this Jedi Master and trying to throw knives every which way to get this woman. And eventually, Amanda is successful in penetrating the force field that is around Indara and getting her right in the heart with a knife. So it is lights out for Indara and our assassin heads off to the next planet to carry out another assassination. So news travels of this assassination and the Jedis find out on their home planet Coruscant and launch a full-scale investigation to find out what the hell is going on? Now, they do have a description of this assassin, and it matches the features of a young woman named Osha, who was working on a spacecraft as a mechnic, which is, I guess, some sort of mechanic fixer for things that go wrong on spacecrafts. Now, Osha is just minding her business, going about her day, working hard on this ship, fixing things, including a space fire. Yep, a space fire. You heard me. I got it. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. The Jedi show up on the spacecraft. They arrest Osha because she fits the description of the assassin, and she denies any wrongdoing and denies responsibility for the death of Indara. Nonetheless, she remains in their custody, and they are going to take her back to Coruscant to question her and investigate the situation. So the Jedi's put homegirl Osha on a little ship with a bunch of other convicts slash prisoners, and they're on their way to Coruscant to, of course, do what they do with these convicts and these prisoners. Now, at some point, the ship gets taken over by these prisoners. Why? I don't know, because they just wanted to have a cool little space crash and reunite her with the Jedis. But Osha is left on this ship that is on a crash course towards some sort of other frozen planet. And what does she do? There's no escape pods because the other prisoners took them. She just straps herself in with some seat belts and lets it go, lets it be. <laughs> they crash into a frozen planet and and Osha wakes up out of a daze completely unscathed. And I'm talking a full force crash into a frozen, rocky 
rock. Some short time after that, the Jedi's that originally arrested Osha learn that her spacecraft crashed into this planet, and they go back for her because they believe that she's still alive, which of course she is somehow. Now, while they're dealing with this roller coaster of ups and downs and arresting Osha and bringing her back to Coruscant for Jedi questioning, I guess, another assassination attempt is carried out on a different Jedi Master, Jedi Master Torben. And again, the assailant fits the description of essentially Osha. So now everyone's aware that Osha couldn't possibly be the assassin because of course she was in custody. She was going through some stuff when Master Torben was being dealt with by this assassin. Now things are sort of starting to line up and people are figuring out what's going on. Earlier in episode one, it is discussed that Osha has, or should I say had a family two moms, yes, you heard me right, two moms, and a twin sister by the name May. Now, it was presumed that both of her moms and her sister May died in a fire that her sister actually set, killing all of them. But it turns out Osha's twin sister May is still alive and is carrying out these assassinations. May is on Master Torben's planet attempting to assassinate him. She comes to find out that he's in a meditative state. He's like a monk-like Jedi master. And he's been in this meditative state for about 10 years. He doesn't speak to anybody, his eyes are closed, and he is constantly protected by the Force. And when May attempts to kill him by stabbing him, like she did with Indara, she is unable to penetrate the Force field that surrounds Master Torben. This time she attempts to level with Master Torben. It's generally understood that these Jedi Masters did something horrible to May, and I guess presumably her family, and that's why she's out to get them. So she tells Master Torben that he knows what he's done, that he's not going to be able to find peace, even though that he thinks he has. And he suddenly awakes out of his meditative state to sit with her and acknowledge that he did do something wrong, although he thought he was doing the right thing. And instead of May having to kill Jedi Master Torben, he kills himself. He just takes the poison that she brought for him, drinks it, and dies. So there we go, a second successful assassination for May. And right as she succeeds in this and leaves, the other Jedis who have Osha show up to intercept her. Their interception attempt doesn't work, and May heads off to assassinate a third Jedi Master. Oh, and just so we're on the same page here, the assassin May, who is, I guess, the twin sister of Osha, has four Jedi Masters she wants to kill. And Dara, done. Torben, done. Kelnaka, not yet, and Soul. So we still have two more on the list that she's gonna hopefully get to at some point, I guess. And that's where we leave out in episode two. Of course, there's a ton of details that I left out, and I hope you're able to follow my summary of those events. But if not, maybe you're gonna have to check it out for yourself, if you're even interested. Now, before we get to punching down on Star Wars The Acolyte, which many are already doing on the internet, I wanna talk about the good things that I saw in this series. First of all, I thought the costume was pretty good, but again, this is my first time watching Star Wars, so I don't really have any frame of reference as far as the other moments in this franchise. So you guys will have to let me know in the comments down below whether or not you stand by that. As far as the acting goes, I wasn't overwhelmingly impressed by anybody in the series, but I do feel as though Amanda Stenberg really holds her own in this show. I don't have many qualms with her performance, at least as of late. The sound effects in the fight scenes I thought were pretty fun and again, didn't leave much to be desired. And I will say when I started this series, I watched all the way through and it held my attention. So there's that. And that's about all I can say as far as good things in this series, which is more than I say for other projects. Now let's get into the bad or the underwhelming parts of this series thus far. I will say just in general, the show is quite flat. I feel like nobody really stood out as far as acting was concerned. None of the plot lines really shook me to my core in any way, shape or form and I found myself just watching along, sort of guessing what was going to happen along the way and being correct more often than not. You'll truly recognize the flatness that I'm talking about in this show when you analyze the side characters. I'm talking about people like Yord, Jeki, the apothecary friend that's helping May with the assassinations. The acting does leave much to be desired with these three and it just generally falls 
flat, as I said before. It seems like none of the side characters are really giving in this series whatsoever. When I tell you there's a lot of unnecessary exposition in this show through the dialogue, I truly mean that. They will tell you every step of the way exactly what they're doing, thinking, and feeling. They don't necessarily trust the audience, it seems, to understand what's going on without directly telling you what's going on. And then, of course, we have some plot holes, I guess, or, or lazy writing is what I would call it. The space fire, which we all know is not possible, of course, takes place. And it was an unnecessary moment in the plot. I feel like some other issue could have arisen and we could have gotten the same effect. But no, it had to be a space fire. Also, when Osha is arrested and she's on a spacecraft that crashes right into another planet, she gets out of that completely unscathed, not a scratch on her. I don't feel as though a lot of these things were thought through through, it seems like they were just inserted into the plot in order to get to a certain destination, which we all know is a no-no. In episode two, when May carries out her assassination on Jedi Master Torben, she uses poison, poison that was provided to her, as I said, by her friend in the apothecary who is aiding her in this mission to assassinate four Jedis. The Jedis find the friend that helped her with this poison. They confront him about it. They actually get him on a tape recording admitting that he knew exactly what was going to happen and that she was going to assassinate Torben. Yet they let the guy go because he cooperated after they found out that he was responsible for helping her? I don't understand. But by the end of episode two, this friend who is helping her with these assassinations links back up with May, and I guess they go off to the next planet to do more killing? Why'd they let him go? I don't know. You guys will have to let me know. And as I said, Amanda Stenberg puts on somewhat of a strong performance, but when it's met with a ton of flatness, she's kind of carrying the team. I also must give a little nod to a character by the name of Vernestra that we really didn't describe in our summary, but is present in the show. She is played by none other than Leslie Headland's wife, and her acting falls very flat uh, in these two episodes. I will say, I can't tell though if the acting is flat with these characters because they're not great actors, or because the writing that they've been provided is not great. And of course, we've saved for the end what you've all, I guess, come here for is my woke scoring of this show. So far, actually, I'll say it's medium. I'm giving it a medium score, a five out of 10. And the only reason I give it a five out of 10 on the woke scale is because I think there's more to come. And that episodes one and two were largely for setting up the plot. And going forward, we're going to get a ton more wokeness and insertion of Ledley Headland's own personal ideology. I think that Star Wars is so gay already. Okay. <laughs> I mean, have you seen it's the fits? <laughs> We'd be like, look how gay this is, and then send each other a reference photo. And are you telling me? with a straight face that C-3PO is straight. They're a couple. That's what I think. <laughs> but so far, we do have a few little tidbits that were sprinkled into this show. In the beginning of episode one, when Indara is being confronted by this assassin, who we now know is May, the twin sister, Indara says to May that Jedi do not attack the unarmed. May looks Indara right in her eyes and says, yes, you do. Immediately, this struck me as sort of a nod to police brutality and the policing issues that we have here in the United States. Let me know if it struck you the same way. I don't know if this has been a present theme throughout the Star Wars franchise, so I can't speak to that, but that's what I saw and felt. The Jedi are repeatedly displayed in this show as some sort of a oppressive force, a police state almost, that goes around causing turmoil within space in the name of peace. And of course, I know that Amanda Stenberg in her personal life is a major activist and supporter of Black Lives Matter, so maybe I'm letting that color what I'm watching in the show. Let me know if you saw that too. I think it wasn't until I was older and I could really understand things infrastructurally that I got, oh right, Hollywood is a white institution. And that means that representations within Hollywood are gonna be extensions of white supremacy. When people watch The Hate You Give, what, what do you want them to walk away with? Because I know everyone has a slightly different feeling. Um, well, I mean, white people crying actually was the goal. Um, <laughs> <we> <laughs> <laughs> and I'll read this quote that sort of summarizes the view that this series has on Jedi and the Jedi Order. It says, the Jedi live in a dream they believe everyone shares. If you attack a Jedi with a weapon, you will fail. But an acolyte kills without a weapon, kills the dream. And we're 
we're repeatedly told that the Jedi sort of feel they're doing the right thing while they're constantly doing the wrong thing, that they're trying to find peace within themselves, but lead an existence that could never truly find them peace because they are the oppressors in this universe. And of course, for anybody who understands leftism, this is a nod to leftism itself, that there is a power structure that exists amongst all people, and it's a power structure that should be broken down. That's what's happening between the Jedi and the others, essentially, in this story. As far as other woke elements, we are told that May and Osha, these two twins, have two moms. Now, they don't really confirm how this happened. Did the two moms adopt Osha and May? Did they conceive Osha and May? There are rumors circulating that this show is going to have an immaculate conception storyline where these two, I guess, lesbian moms are capable of having twin daughters, but I cannot confirm or deny that that's the case. Another is the diversity in this show. You'll be pretty hard pressed to find a, a white man in this show in any sort of significant role. And if he is in one, he's probably going to die. The diversity is strong with this one. Now, if there's one thing I can appreciate is that really the diversity isn't referenced. I'm not sure how you would reference diversity within the Star Wars universe. So it kind of is this unspoken, acknowledged thing that's happening as you're watching. But oh my gosh, were the diversity quotas on this series high. You have somebody of every race. There are women everywhere. There is all different body types. You look at some of these scenes and you can just tell the goal was to have as few white people as possible in this series. Which, hey, if you can do it and do it smoothly and it's not referenced, I'm open to that. I'm just curious how, if you guys noticed this about watching this show. There is a little flirting between Osha and another female character, and I wonder if that's going to play out further in the series. Leslie Headland has made it very clear that this is going to be a queer story, so I'm wondering exactly how that plays out. There's also rumors that Amanda Listenberg's character, I don't know whether or not it will be Osha or May, is going to be non-binary, and we're going to start having to insert pronouns into the next episodes of this series. So I honestly cannot wait for that. And the pronoun thing won't be a first for Star Wars. We've covered on this show a Star Wars cartoon that was referring to a character as they and them. They're still alive. We need to get them to the ship. We can save them. And so far, that's all I noticed as far as woke nods in this new series. If I missed anything, let me know in the comments down below. I am sure there is going to be more. As I said, I score this a five out of 10 only because I'm leaving room for what's going to happen further along in the series. As we've been told, this is not necessarily a Star Wars project. It's a Leslie Headland project. And Leslie Headland is going to insert as much of herself as possible into this storyline while sprinkling in a little bit of George Lucas's original IP. Leslie Headland's name, of course, is all over the ending credits of this show, written by Leslie Headland, directed by Leslie Headland, created by Leslie Headland. I'm surprised they didn't sprinkle in sexuality by Leslie Headland, pronouns by Leslie Headland, queer story by Leslie Headland. And right after that, we get based on Star Wars by George Lucas, which I can't help but feel is completely emblematic of where we are with Hollywood right now. It is a Leslie Headland story with a little bit of George Lucas's Star Wars sprinkled into it. And that seemingly is the case for every new movie and TV series we get these days. It is the director, the writer, the creator putting themselves and their own story at the forefront, and then the actual original IP and source material at the very tail end of everything we watch. So there you have it. I watched the first two episodes of Star Wars The Acolyte. I guess I can continue this series if you guys want me to and let you know how I feel about the show. Let me know in the comments down below. As I said, I, I watched the whole thing. It, it kept my attention, although I clearly have my qualms with the writing and, uh, you know, every everything else about this show. Let me know your thoughts if you watched it. Let me know your pros and cons down below. And as always, if you disagree with me, duke it out, but do so respectfully as we encourage healthy debates in the comments. If you like this video, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time I post a video for you guys, which is every day. And I will see you next time. May the force be with you. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better.